Thank you. All right. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for coming. Uh, before uh, the way things are going to run, um, first of all, I am going to walk around a fair bit, and I'll have this is uh, Elliot and Ellery, two of my students. They're going to walk around with animals a little bit so you can get a closer look. Um, if you want to see the animals, I encourage you to come up fairly close. If you don't want to be close to the animals, you might want to sit back in the back. Um, also, as I said, we'll walk around and you can look at some of these animals a little bit more closely, but we're going to hold off on touching and holding and asking questions until the end, okay? We'll have some time at the end where you can touch and hold some of the snakes, but for now, just look at them. So don't mob the person with the, with the animal, okay? Uh, also, I'll be doing a fair bit of question and answer. Please raise your hand if you think you know the answer or want to say something or have a question, and uh, don't just yell out too much. Um, and hopefully, you'll learn a lot today. So, uh, my name is J.D. Wilson, um, and I'm a herpetologist. So that means I study reptiles and amphibians. What kind of animals am I talking about when I say reptiles and amphibians? Snakes. Snakes. What else? Frogs. Frogs. Lizards. Got a new one? Do you know one? Crocodiles. Great one. We missed that the last time. Yeah. Axolotls. Axolotls. Yeah, axolotls are a type of salamander. Newts. Newts. Newts are also in the salamander group. Any others? Did we say? Turtles. Turtles. Yeah, we got the big ones. There's a couple of weird ones. Like anyone ever heard of a Sicilian? You heard of a Sicilian? What is a Sicilian? <laughs> Have you heard of a Sicilian? We discovered they're definitely the least well known of our amphibians. So they're an amphibian. They look for all the. I wish I had one to show you. We don't have them here locally. They're mostly in the tropics, but they're very diverse in the tropics. There are several hundred species. They look like giant earthworms. If you saw one, you'd think it was a giant earthworm. They're blind, they're legless, they're slimy. They have a segmented body, kind of like a worm, but they're an amphibian. If you look inside their body, they have bones, they have teeth. They're predators. They're very much more like a salamander than like an earthworm. There's also something called a tuatara, which I got bagged on for not mentioning the last time, which looks for all the world like a lizard. But if you look at its actual scientific evolutionary history, it, it's not a lizard. It's more like a dinosaur, essentially, or it dates back to way before lizards. So broadly, those are the types of animals I'm interested in. I'm going to focus mostly on snakes today, but before we get there, let's talk a little bit more just about reptiles and amphibians in general. And to get us started, let's take a look at a couple of animals that are sort of representative here. So I've got two animals here. One of these is a reptile and one's an amphibian. Which one's this? Amphibian. amphibian. This is a salamander. This is called a spotted Here, I know you've seen one. Quite a few people, yeah. So we've got some budding herpetologists in here. These are actually one of the most common animals in the woods around here, but most people have never seen one because they spend all their life living underground in burrows. They really only come out a few times a year during rainy nights to go to little wetlands and ponds to breed and lay their eggs. What's this? 
a lizard, it's a leopard gecko, most people got that. This is, most of the animals I'm gonna show you today are local species that we have around here. This is one that is not. These are from uh, Asia. They're a really popular pet reptile. I will say for those parents looking for a good starter pet reptile for your kids, these are great. They're bred in captivity, so you don't have to worry about them coming from the wild. They're very easy to keep. Once you get them set up right, you know, you can leave for two weeks on vacation and they're fine. Uh, the one caveat I will say is reptiles make great pets, but they are a long-term commitment, right? So who here is 10 years old or younger? Younger than 10. Who here is younger than 20? Who's, who's over 25 in this room? <laughs> So, got to raise her little hand here too. I've had, I've had this lizard for I think 23 years and she was an adult when I got her. So these, they live a long time. Reptiles have a very different sort of lifestyle than things like mammals and birds and some of the other animals we think about. They sort of live a slow life for the most part. They don't use a lot of energy. They live underground a lot of the time. They live a long time. They reproduce slowly. Um, these are animals that we call, well, so amphibians and reptiles are totally different groups of animals, but we often talk about them together because their biologies are fairly similar. And a lot of that boils down to the fact that they are what we call ectotherms. Anybody know what an ectotherm is? It's a big word. Anybody know? Ectotherm? So if we, if we look at that word and break it down, ectotherm basically means outside temperature. So it means they get their temperature from the outside. So, you know, sort of most people use the term cold-blooded to talk about these kind of animals. We don't really like that term cold-blooded. We, we like the scientific term ectotherm. Why, why don't we like the term cold-blooded, do you think? Yeah, it's got kind of a negative connotation to it. Why else don't we like that, do you think, to refer to these guys? Yeah? Because their blood's not cold. Because their blood's not really cold, right? This lizard, actually, his, his, the temperature he likes to be is 85, 90 degrees. Not too different from our temperature. So they're not really cold. They just don't heat their body from the inside the way we do. Or to be cooler than 90 degrees, which this, this guy likes to be cooler than 90 degrees, he needs to go hide under a rock or go underground. So, amphibian, reptile. What, what are the big differences between an amphibian and a reptile? Yeah. Um, one usually like lives in the water, close to water. Yeah, generally amphibians are more associated with water and particularly they usually lay their eggs in the water. So almost all amphibians lay their eggs in the water and they have some sort of a larva like a tadpole that they grow up with. Reptiles mostly lay eggs or the, some give live birth and they do that on land. So most reptiles are sort of land living. Amphibians are, they like moisture and a lot of them live in the water. For that reason, most amphibians like this salamander are slimy and have sort of smooth slimy skin and they're, they can't dry out. If they dry out, they die almost immediately. Most All right, let's see. Before we move on to snakes, maybe I'll pull out one just interesting other reptile before we get to snakes. I brought one turtle for you. And it's one that's kind of cool because it's a turtle that's a little bit different from most of the turtles that we're familiar with. And it's one that you might not have seen. This is called a soft shell turtle. And these are actually a pretty common turtle in our rivers around here, but they're really hard to get a look at. Most people think of turtles as being slow. They are very quick. If you try to catch one in the water, good luck. They are very, very fast. You can <laughs> they're very quick. Um, they're also different from most, so we usually think of turtles as having a big, hard, heavy shell. These are called a soft shell turtle because their shell is covered with skin. They have much less bone in their shell. Most turtles, so the shell on a turtle is actually part of its skeleton. It's basically its ribs. So a turtle can't come out of its shell or you can't take a turtle out of its shell. Its shell is part of its body. 
but these guys have less bone and it's covered with skin and they're very flat. Why do you think, why would these guys give up having a big, hard, heavy shell that protects them from predators? They can move faster in water. They can move faster in water, right. These are river turtles, right? A normal pond turtle, like a slider turtle, doesn't live very well in a river because it's so big and heavy and bulky that it can't fight the current. These are perfectly streamlined, they're light, they're fast, and they do really well in rivers. They also have, you probably saw his neck sticking out a minute ago. They have a really long neck. There he goes. And their nose is way out on the end of their snout. They've got like a little snorkel. And his favorite thing to do is to go up to a sandbar on a river and bury himself under the sand in water that's about this deep. And he'll sit there and wait for things like crayfish and insects to come by. And when he needs to breathe, he'll just stick up his neck like a snorkel. They get a lot bigger. They get a lot bigger. Yeah, so this is a small one. They're very, um, the males and females are very different in size. So males only get about six inches or so. Females can be trash can lid yeah. size. They can be very big. But really neat turtle. Keep your eyes out for them, you know, on most of the big rivers around here. Even some of the ponds, the larger neat turtle. All right, let's get into some of these guys here. Is this our next one? Yeah, okay. All right, this will be a good challenge because I think we've got some reptile enthusiasts in the room here. Let's test your knowledge. Yeah, all right. Let's try this one. Does anybody know what this is? Do you know? <laughs> garter snake, good, good guess. It's sort of striped. Garter snakes are striped. We'll see a garter snake in a minute. This is not a garter snake, but that's a great guess. Ring, ring, snake. ring snake, nope, not a ring neck snake. They would have a ring around their neck. <laughs> Anybody know? Yeah? Ribbon snake? ribbon snake, that's another good guess. We'll see a ribbon snake in a minute too. They have stripes as well. What was that? Is it a racer? Racer, another good guess. Long and slender like a racer. Not a brown snake. This is not a snake. This is a lizard. This is a legless lizard. So uh, around the world, there's actually a whole bunch of groups of different species of legless lizards. These are basically groups of lizards that live underground in burrows. And when you live underground, legs don't really do much. You know, it, it's almost more trouble than it's worth to have legs. And so most lizards that live underground have very small reduced limbs, and a lot of them have lost their limbs entirely. So this is actually Most people have never seen them. I've only seen a couple. They're very hard to find. They're underground most of the time. How do I know if this is a lizard and not a snake? It's head shape. It's head shape? Yeah, its head is a little bit different. It's got kind of specific about it. Their jaws are different than snakes. They can't stretch their jaws the same way that a snake can. So snakes are kind of famous for eating big prey. A snake this size could eat a whole mouse, no problem. This guy, the biggest thing he could eat is like a cricket, a pretty small cricket. <laughs> But there are some even better characteristics that tell him from a snake. Can it lose its, like, can it lose its tail? Like, yeah, that's a great one. So you see his tail stumpy and it's got a little point. He's actually lost his tail and he's starting to regrow it again. Snakes, they can, their tail can break off. You know, they can get in. As a defense mechanism. And the idea is a lot of lizards do this. Their tail breaks off, it even, it wiggles for like 30 minutes after it detaches. And the idea is that distracts the predator, the predator eats the tail and the lizard gets away. In fact, these guys are mostly tail. His tail's broken once already, but his tail starts here and it used to be probably almost twice this long. So he used to be like two thirds tail. So his tail's different, what else is different? Yeah? He's kind of different. They're actually, if you held him, his body is fairly different. He's not as flexible as a snake. You'll see he, he can't really tie himself in knots or in circles like a snake can. But there's a couple of things about his head that are very different from a snake. If you stare at this guy long enough, he'll eventually blink at you. 
Snakes don't have eyelids. Snakes have a protective scale that goes over their eye. It's a clear scale. Their eyes dry, it's not wet, and they never blink. They don't have eyelids at all. Most lizards have eyelids, including these legless lizards. So if you stare at them, essentially has a hole in the side of his head on each side. It's kind of hard to see in his pattern, but he's got sort of a hole. Those are his ears. Lizards, most lizards have external ear openings that are basically a hole in the side of their head. And they hear very much the same way we do. Snakes don't hear the same way we do. They feel vibrations, but they don't have an external ear opening. They don't hear sound the same way that we do. So if you had music with a really loud bass, they could feel that vibration. But I could yell at a snake all day across the room and it would never hear me the way that you know most animals can. They hear. They don't have an external Which, ear. Where are turtles' nose is pain? I believe it. Turtles are extremely intelligent. Yeah. yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. We want it to think it knows its <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised. Turtles are incredibly intelligent, and they hear. And so. she loves when, it loves when she Legless lizard? Let's see. Let's get to some real snakes, though. Where do we have here? Is this the right one? I think it's the right one. All right, we'll start with a couple of the ones that you're most likely to see around here. These are very common backyard snakes. One of the guesses we had before. I think we had both of these guess the legless lizard. These are a garter snake and a ribbon snake. Both really common, they're closely related. You can tell them apart. Garter snakes are usually a little bit more heavy bodied. So, I mean, obviously one of these is bigger than the other. Ribbon snakes can get a little bit longer than this, but garter snakes are usually a little bit thicker and more heavy bodied. They also, if you look, the garter snake has sort of black bars on his lips, lip scales, whereas the ribbon snake has nice clean white lip scales. But these are really common snakes around here. They're mostly, um, they basically eat slimy things. So frogs are their favorite, earthworms, uh, occasionally fish, although they're not really aquatic in the same way that a water snake is. Um, occasionally other sort of soft bodied insects and things like that. They are, they are not grab it and swallow it whole, uh, usually while it's alive, which is a little gruesome, but that's how they do it. Um, these are really common suburban snakes. You'll have populations of these. Really common, uh, they're important prey for a lot of our predators around here. So things like some of our hawks and owls really love to eat snakes. These are some of their favorite. Um, another neat thing about this group of snakes, there's sort of a whole group of snakes that includes the garter snakes and water snakes. These are, um, one interesting thing about them is that they give birth to live young. So they don't lay eggs the way that most reptiles do. They essentially have unshelled eggs that they hold in their body until they fully develop. And so these um, in about July and August will give birth to little miniature baby snakes. In fact, that's the reason we have this one. We're keeping her as part of one of our, our uh, projects. These are both wild snakes, and she's got some babies. You can probably see, if you watch really closely as I bring my finger along, you'll see it sort of go bloop, bloop, bloop. Those are her unshelled eggs inside her body. So she's gonna have five or six babies here in a month or so. Yeah? Ooh, yeah, that's, uh, so what you're describing is um, a lot of these snakes, one of their defenses, if they get really scared, is to basically barf up what they've eaten recently. So when they eat a frog whole and they get scared, they'll just barf up their, uh, their recently eaten frog. It's pretty gross. I'm not surprised it repels predators occasionally. Yeah. Um, what size are the babies? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I actually got one. I got a little one. Um, they... 
so different snakes have babies that are different sizes. Most of sort of these types of snakes, where are they? Um, they're gonna be about this big, maybe. And what I've got here is one, a ribbon snake that is one that would have been born last year, so it's almost a year old. If I can get them. Maybe I'll send this around. I've been forgetting to send some of these guys around. Maybe I'll send him around with you. This is a little one that's about a year old. Would have been born last summer. All right, while we're doing these, uh, the sort of garter snake type snakes, this is a good next one for that group. This is another one of our most common, that's the one I just did. One of our most common snakes. Yeah. And unfortunately, this is one that sort of gets a bad reputation a lot of the time. Gets misidentified a lot. Yeah. It's a water snake. It is a water snake, you're right. They do. So, this is, this might be our most common snake. Certainly anywhere around water, this is probably the most common snake you're gonna see. This is a northern water snake or common water snake or midland water snake. The, the names are somewhat confusing, but this is our most common water snake. They're basically almost any pond, lake, stream, wetland, river, has at least some of these, and they can be really common, especially in the rivers around here or areas with like uh, a lot of rocky uh, gravel and stuff. They really like those kind of areas. Unfortunately, this is one that, like this in the they see a brown blotched pattern and they immediately think that it's a cottonmouth or a copperhead. And so unfortunately, a lot of these get killed needlessly. Um, this is a good time for me to plug, and I guess some of the books got checked out. I encourage you, if you're interested in these animals, and, or even if you're just out in the woods a lot, to take some time and study up, especially on our venomous species. I don't have any venomous snakes with me today, but the ones that you need to look out for around here are copperhead, cottonmouth, which is the same thing as a water moccasin, and then we have two species of rattlesnakes, the timber rattlesnake and pygmy rattlesnake. And there are some defining characteristics the copperhead particularly has a very definitive pattern. It's a hourglass or sort of Hershey kiss shaped pattern. Um, you'll hear people say that venomous snakes have a triangular, which is because they tend to have very large heads because they have venom glands in their head. But a lot of our non-venomous snakes also have large heads. And in fact, as a defense, they'll often sort of flatten out their head to look triangular. So I don't really like that as a definitive characteristic. The best thing is to just do some research and look at some pictures. We're lucky in Arkansas to have one of the best websites for um, reptiles and amphibians in the state. And there's a great Herps of Arkansas website that has lots of pictures and lots of good information. So yeah, you're likely to see these, especially in the springtime. You often see them basking on tree branches over the water or you'll see them uh, swimming in shallow water looking for fish. This is a good time also to talk about what to do if you see a snake in the wild. Um, none of our snakes, venomous snakes included, are out to get you, right? Some of them can be defensive if they feel scared. Almost any wild animal can feel defensive if it's scared. But nearly any snake we have around here, if you're five feet away, you're safe. So if you see a snake, take a step back. If it comes in your direction, that means that it wants there. Just take a step to the side and let it go past you. They're not out to get you. And in fact, you know, if you're five feet away or you know, reasonable distance, take some time to observe the snake, whether it's venomous or not. And uh, especially these water snakes are really neat to watch. If you see one along a river, Take some time and watch it. You'll often be able to see them trying to catch minnows or trying to catch frogs along the shore. They do some really neat stuff and are really fun to watch. And certainly do your research and learn your local snake species. So that's another one. Generally, water snakes have their bodies some more. 
often cotton mouse when they swim sort of float on the surface, oh. but that's not 100% either way. And cotton mouse can definitely swim underwater and they can bite underwater. So that should not be used as a definitive <laughs> identification. Just because it's swimming on top does not mean that it's a copperhead or a cotton mouth or vice versa. That's not a very good thing to do. <laughs> um, I, would, I would recommend observing them from a distance for sure. All right, what do we have now? Let's see. Let's do. All right, I think this is my favorite local snake. Certainly one of the prettiest. Who knows what this one is? King snake, right? This is a speckled king snake. This is our sort of local version of the king snake. King snakes are one of the most widely distributed snakes in the country, so they're found from New Jersey to Florida to California. They vary in pattern across that range, but this is what they look like here. They're speckled. Um, this one is actually, would, would be even more brilliant. It would be more yellow, but, and if you look at its eyes, you'll see its eyes are cloudy. They're kind of gray and cloudy. That's because he's about to shed his skin. So. He's young, right? No, he's an adult. Okay. Um, they get a little bigger than this, but not a lot bigger than this. So those cloudy eyes mean that he's about to shed his skin. So as snakes grow, they basically outgrow their skin. Their skin doesn't grow with them. So they need to shed as they grow to, um, so that their skin can grow larger as well. Um, they also shed their skin sometimes to rid themselves of parasites like ticks, or if they get injured, it can be part of the healing process. So. He has cloudy eyes like that because basically what's happening is he's got a new layer of skin underneath that's bigger and his body basically secretes some slippery stuff in between the layers of skin and that's what that gray color is and that's gonna help him shed his skin off a little bit later. Who knows why these are called king snakes? <laughs> king river. King river, no. They eat other snakes, right? Yeah, so this one's sort of famous as being a really good snake to have around. Um, they eat all kinds of things. They'll eat almost anything. They'll eat frogs, lizards, mammals, you know, rodents, birds even. But almost their favorite thing to eat are other snakes. They like turtle eggs a lot too. They eat turtle eggs frequently. Um, but they really like to eat other snakes. They're actually mostly immune to the venom of our venomous snakes. And as we said, snakes have this ability to unhinge their, or not unhinge their jaws, but they have very flexible jaw structure that allows them to eat a really big prey item. So all snakes can eat really big prey, but if you're eating a snake, you can actually eat an even bigger prey because they're not very big around. You know, the maximum dimension isn't very big. So these guys, I've seen king snakes eat a snake that's actually longer than it is. So he could eat a snake that's Snakes are known to eat prey that weigh more than they do, which is incredible. I mean, imagine eating a cheeseburger that weighs more than you do in one bite without chewing it, right? So they're kind of famous for eating other snakes. Um, even if you don't particularly like snakes, these are great to have around. These are quite common. If you spend any time in the woods around here, you'll see one eventually. Even in the residential neighborhoods around Fayetteville, you still see them. Um, on a sort of conservation note, this species has, has disappeared from much of the southeast in places where they used to be quite common. We're not really sure why. Uh, some people think fire ants may be the problem. Um, but we're lucky to still have these fairly commonly here. They're just really neat snakes. They, uh, they're strong constrictors, so they kill their prey by constricting. And, um, and uh, where was I going with that? Lost my train of thought. They kill their prey by, by constricting. Even other snakes? Yeah, even other snakes. Um, and 
I felt like I had something else to say about this guy. I lost it. Um, but anyway, these are really neat snakes. They're one of our most common, sort of larger, more predatory snakes. These are egg layers. So unlike the water snake and garter snake, these, these are laying eggs. Egg laying season for snakes is right about now. Um, although snake eggs, you don't find snake nests very often at all. Usually when you see reptile eggs, they're turtle eggs. Turtle eggs get dug up by raccoons and things like that a lot. But they'll be hatching in the late summer, like in late August or September. All right. How are we doing on time? OK. Maybe I'll do one more quick. So here's one more that is not one that we find around here. It's kind of a neat one because this, believe it or not, is a boa. Most people, when I say a boa, think of a big boa constrictor, which is a really large tropical snake that gets 12 feet long, 15 feet long or more. This is an adult, and this is actually one of, we have two species of boas that actually range into the US. This is one, it's called a rubber boa. It's found in the Western US from Um, really neat little snake, really, they're called a rubber boa because they actually feel almost rubbery. Their skin is almost velvety. And we'll have this guy out at the end for you to touch. If you're afraid to touch a snake, try touching this guy. He's really, really feels neat. It's uh, <laughs> almost rubbery. These guys, um, they grow really slowly. They live a long time, you know, in places like Idaho, these might only be active for two months of the year and they spend... 10 months of the year in hibernation, essentially. Um, really neat little snakes. If you look, his tail is kind of stubby. That's not an injury, so he's, his tail is supposed to be like that. Their defense mechanism is that their tail's stubby and basically looks a lot like their head. And when he gets scared, he rolls up into a ball and leaves his tail sticking out. And the idea is, or thinks that that's his head and attacks the tail. In fact, when you catch these in the wild, they often have scars all over their tails where things have chewed on their tails as a uh, defense like that. So really neat little snake. Most people don't realize we have boas here in the US. All right, we'll do one more. All right. Okay, this is probably the largest common snake you're likely to see around here and is one of our most common species. Let's get him out here. Here we go. All right, there we go. All right. So this is a rat snake here in a couple of mentions. Sounds like some people know what this is. So this is a rat snake. Some people call them chicken snakes. Um, probably our largest, at least heaviest local snake. This one is an adult. He's about six feet long, but not a huge adult. They get even a bit bigger than this. Um, these are constrictors and they spend a lot of their time in trees. They're really, really good climbers. And so they're very muscular. So these are really strong. Uh, you can come up and touch him at the end and feel how strong he is. These eat mostly rodents and birds, and they really like to eat bird eggs. So these are really accomplished uh, predators on bird nests. They also are very attracted to chicken coops. If you have a chicken coop, you've probably removed rat snakes before. It's like a magnet to these guys, but they're harmless. Offensive if you find a wild one, but if you're gentle with them and don't scare them, they tame down really quickly and uh, are very docile usually. There's another snake called a black racer, which is similar and sort of people collectively refer to them as black snakes. Racers are very fast moving and um, active mostly on the ground, mostly during the day. And usually if you see a racer, you're just seeing its tail zoom off into the underbrush. These tend to be a little bit more slow moving. And in fact, one of their sort of classic behaviors is when you walk up on one, they freeze and they kink their body.
kind of a little zigzag pattern that presumably is sort of breaking up its outline and making it easier to blend in or harder to see. Um, these, as I said, they love to eat birds and bird nests. They love to eat squirrels. A big one like this is a, a squirrel eater. That's one of their favorite foods. So these are great to have around your barn or your garage. Great for keeping rodents under control. Harmless. Um, what else can I say about rat snakes? Um, as I said, these are really, really good climbers. And one interesting thing about them is how they climb. So if you look at one of the sort of key features of a rat snake, if you look, we say they're sort of bread shaped, which basically means they're flat on the bottom, right? And that basically helps them climb. So if you think about it, if you're a snake like this and you need to climb, how do you climb without any claws or fingers? Right? And in fact, this guy, he doesn't even need tree limbs or anything like that to climb on. He'll go right up a brick wall or right up the bark of a tree without branches. And he does that because he's got these wide scales on his underside. And those scales are smooth. They point backward. So if you go this way, they're smooth. If you go this way, they catch. Right? And the edge of that flat bottom, he basically has like a little edge or corner on each side. And those, under, those overlapping scales basically allows him to catch on things with those scales. And so it's almost like he has hundreds of little claws. And each of those ribs is controlled by an individual set of muscles. So he can actually individually move those ribs and almost use And he'll climb slowly, but go right up a brick wall, no problem, without any, without any fingers or claws. Yeah? How long has this guy been in captivity? I think we've had him for about six years, seven years. Um, so a while, but some of those others have been much longer. We've got a corn snake that we'll pull out in a minute that's, I think I've had for 16 years, 17 years. So most snakes can easily live 20 years. Many can live considerably longer than that. Yeah? How long can they actually get? How long can they actually get? The record size rat snake, I think, is up around eight feet. So this guy's about six feet. Um, so about a foot or two longer than that. We don't see them over seven feet very often at all. Yeah? Um, snakes actually don't dig the holes, crawdads do. That's right. So yeah, a lot of times people talk about snake holes. And certainly a lot of snakes love to go down and live in holes. But most snakes don't dig their own holes. So they'll use crawdad holes. They'll use rodent burrows, uh, rabbit burrows, things like that. Only a few snakes really dig much on their own. And a lot of those, you can often tell a snake that digs on its own because most of them have some sort of like a, a special scale on their nose that acts like a shovel that they can kind of use to dig with. Yeah. Uh, yeah, one that we have around here is called a hog nose snake, which they're called a hog nose because they have a little, it's kind of like a little pig nose. It's an upturned nose. And they, they really like sandy soil, and they'll dig their own burrows sometimes. Any other questions or comments before we do some holding and stuff? Yeah. We have rat snakes at our house because we have chickens, and they eat our eggs. And so we've seen them a lot in, at our chicken coop. Yeah, they're, unfortunately, they... They, so snakes, especially snakes, well, different snakes forage in different ways. Rat snakes are using a combination of smell and sight to find their food. Um, most, many snakes use smell mostly. So when you see him flicking his tongue, which of course he's not doing right now, but many times, there he goes. So when you see them flicking their tongue, they're smelling. So it's, it's equivalent to smelling. Basically, their tongue comes out and picks up the same kind of chemicals that we smell in the air. And they're very good at smelling out prey smelling out they can their tongue why do you think their tongue I thought they were two nostrils. I two kind of like having two nostrils but even better than that one's for, one's for tasting not really why would you have a forked tongue if you were smelling with your tongue
Yeah, essentially to smell in both directions, right? So if it's forked, they can, they can taste the air, sort of smell in two directions, and they can tell whether the smell is coming from this way or that way. So they use it to, direct, to tell the direction that a smell, a smell is coming from. Yeah? <laughs> yes? Okay, well, you can see him in a minute. <laughs> One more? Yeah. What's the average lifespan of a rat snake? Ooh, the average lifespan of a rat snake. Well, I'll say they certainly can live 20 years or more. Um, in the wild, it's tough to say. They have a lot of predators, so things like hawks get them, uh, things like foxes and raccoons and stuff. So my guess is in the wild it might be five years or something like that. But if you see a big rat snake, a good adult rat snake, it's probably at least a four or five-year-old snake. Uh, yeah, well, you may see them with, with eggs inside oh, them or something. Yeah, this guy's pretty heavy. I mean, you don't see rat snakes thicker than this very often. Um, we do have some other black colored snakes, like a hognose snake can be a little more heavy body. They, they also inflate themselves and do some crazy defensive displays. Um, one thing that you, you mentioned, though, is that snakes, they do, unlike you know, us, for instance, they keep growing through their whole life. So they will sort of slow down, but, and you can't age a snake by its size, but an old snake gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's some relationship between, it's very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, when we were mentioning shedding, so um, we saw that king snake was starting to shed. A rattlesnake's rattle is essentially made of keratin. It's sort of a modified scale. It's part of its skin. And so every time a rattlesnake sheds, it adds a new segment to its rattle. Now, rattles, or any snake might shed. An older snake might shed just once a year. When they're growing fast, they might shed three or four times a year. So or the length of a rattlesnake's rattle, if it's not broken, which they break as well, is an indication of how, it tells you how many times it's shed. It doesn't tell you exactly how old it is, it's but a rattlesnake with a long rattle is an older snake. One more? Oh, how can you tell a boy from a girl? Good question. So you can basically tell by looking at their tail, um, and you need to have seen a lot of snakes to <laughs> know. But basically, male snakes have bigger, longer tails than females do, for most species, at least. One interesting thing, um, in some snakes, males get bigger than females. In other snakes, females get bigger than males. So in rat snakes, and rattlesnakes, males get bigger than females. This is a male. Females, this would be a really big female. In some snakes, like the water snakes and garter snakes, females get bigger than males. Basically, the, the um, primary factor that dictates that is whether males fight for females. So rattlesnakes and rat snakes have what we call ritualized combat for females. So males, they fight each other, but it's in a very, um, it's not in an aggressive way, it's in a very uh, um, stereotyped, I don't know what the best word is, but they have a very, they don't bite each other, they basically arm wrestle without arms. So they twirl their bodies together and they try to push the other one over and whoever gets, whoever pushes the other one over is the winner and usually goes off with the female afterwards. So snakes that have male-male combat where it's good to be big have larger males. For species that don't do that, like water snakes and garter snakes, the females get big because they can have more babies and the males stay small. Yeah, one more. Snakes are reptiles, so they have scales. They're not wet. In fact, I encourage you to come up in a second and touch a snake. Many people think that snakes are cold and slimy. They're usually neither cold nor slimy. They're usually soft and scaly. All right, I think we'll wrap that up and what we'll do is put a few snakes a couple of lines that go to each person and wait your turn and you'll get a chance to hold one or two. Maybe let's do the, uh, you want to do the rubber ball? That's, that's not him, is it? I can check. I don't think that's him. He's probably in here.